in that ministry. I believe with all my heart, your heart's right. You want God to do something for you. And I listen to the reason I believe God will clothe you. I've watched you work and I've watched you labor. I've watched you submit these years. Uh, but can I say I believe that's why God will do it for you. Uh, because when all it was was pouring water, uh, when all it was was taking care of the man of God, uh, that was enough. But I believe there'll come a day uh, where God will clothe you uh, in your own clothes for your own ministry. But because you were willing to labor behind a plow and you were willing to labor behind a prophet I tell you young person you need to learn how to love the man of God Amen And I know that's a picture of serving God Our problem is our churches are full of a lot of people trying to minister to everybody else who never learned how to minister to Christ Amen Amen. See, most of our young people want to go from the plow to the platform. Most of our young preachers want to come out of Bible college and go from the plow to the platform. Amen. You want the platform, you want that 30 minutes to preach, but you don't want anything to do with that thing goes awry and you've got to find the leadership of God. Hey, I'm telling you when the problem comes up, you better thank God for that season in the shadow of the prophet. Everybody okay? <sighs> Labor of the plow, the love of the prophet. Somebody said, you're most like Christ. You're serving others. Probably be a good thing. Boy, Brother Jones said it right this morning. We're not lords. We're ministers. Somebody Jones said, you don't care what you call me. I said, I call you a wise man. Amen. He went from the labor of the plow to the love of the prophet. Surely it was time. Surely it was time to get that power. Oh, no. He had one more, he had one more place. There was a lonely path that he had to walk. Dr. C.L. Roach said years ago, an old preacher, some of you all seniors do not remember that name, Dr. C.L. Roach said the ministry of the, he said the road of the mantle is a lonely road. Now I say to you young people, if you don't learn how to walk along, in the words of Dr. Hudson, you won't, learn long, you won't walk for long if you don't learn how to walk a long. That's right. Amen. Hey, listen to me. I said it yesterday. The great hindrances will not be the what's. It will be the who's. That's why you got to be in step, Brother Bo. Because if you're not in step with your companion, you won't be able to make it on the lonely road. He went to Bethel. First, he started at Gilgal. Let me quickly hasten. Where was, what was Gilgal? Gilgal was the first step of the first stop they made after they crossed the Jordan in the Old Testament. It was the first stop they made. What did they do? They reinstituted the Passover and they began to circumcise all those children that had been born. What did they do? They were cutting away the reproach of Egypt. And may I say, if you're going to get a double portion, you may have spent some time behind the plow and you might have spent some time behind the prophet. But before you get to the Jordan and part the waters, you're going to have to go to the place where the flesh is crucified. And hear me. There's no set of rules that you can make up for your life. There's no set of do's and don'ts that you can have for your life that will kill your flesh. There's only one thing in your life going to deal with your flesh, and it's the Holy Ghost. Amen. Gilgal, place the flesh was crucified. Number two, they went to Bethel. Bethel was a great place in the Old Testament. Are you going to have to walk a while? Y'all just, y'all just saying, I'm going to walk. I'm not going to walk away. I've got too much at stake. You're going to have to walk somewhere. You don't need to walk away. Well, if you walk with him, he's going to take you to some places you might not have wanted to go. Bethel played a great place. 
Bethel means the house of God. Bethel was the place that Abraham never, oh, listen to me, listen, Bethel was the place uh, oh, where Abraham built his first altar. Oh, Bethel was the place that Jacob met God uh, oh, for the first time, but Bethel was not what it used to be. Uh, Jerome had raised up calf worship, uh, and yes, it was still called Bethel. Uh, it had never changed its name, uh, oh, but what was going on at Bethel uh, oh, was blaspheming to the truth of God. It was God dishonoring. And may I say, he said, do you want to stay here? He said, no, I don't want to stay here. And you young people better hear me, the contemporaries and the compromisers, they want you with all that God. But if you're going to get to a double portion with the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to walk off. Again, never changed its name, just changed its practice. Leonard Ravenhill said, when God opens the windows to bless us, you better get ready because the devil's going to open the doors of hell to blast you. Place where the foe, listen, place where flesh was crucified, place where faith was corrupted. Then they went to Jericho, place where the foe was conquered. Jericho had fallen, it was under a curse, God cursed it, they had raised it back up. Well, there was a great need in Jericho for a preacher. And Elijah said, I'm going on. And Elisha said, nope, if you go, you're the one that's got the power. And without you, I can do nothing. Would to God we would realize it's all about him. But then he went to the Jordan. And it wasn't the place where the flesh was crucified. And it wasn't the place where the foe was conquered. And it wasn't the place where faith was corrupted. But he went to the Jordan. That's where the future was claimed. Them death waters. One place in the New Testament said, Jesus looked at him and said, if you could handle it, I'd tell you that John the Baptist is Elijah. That's what he said. If you could receive it, I would tell you this is Elijah. Who else got in the Jordan water? I believe it was Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, amen. Hey, and here we have it in the Old Testament, the Old Testament Elijah. And here's a listen, a servant of God, they walked off into those death waters, those waters of identification. Hey, listen, Elijah wanted everybody to know. He wanted the 50 prophets to know. I've identified myself oh, with this kind. Oh, this is my kind that he denied and he died to himself. Can I tell you this? The Bible said, every man to come after me, deny himself, take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. Didn't say deny himself things. He said deny himself. There's a big difference between denying ourselves things. Peter didn't have any trouble walking off from his boat in his nets. But it wasn't until Jesus looked at him in the eye and said, lovest thou me more than these, that Peter finally denied himself. Let's just be honest with you. Most of the only, we think we've arrived because we've got some things fixed out here. And we've got some things fixed right here. And we've got some things fixed in here. Most of us have fixed what the old man gave us permission to fix. Most of us ain't got enough fix to make the old man nervous. Amen. He's, we've got enough fix to let everybody else give our old man a break. Say amen right there. Hey, but can I tell you, young person, when you get to the place, it's not about denying yourself things, uh, oh, but it's giving God the preeminence and the prominence uh, in your Christian life. You're about to get to a place uh, uh, where a battle can fall on you and you can get a double portion of the work and the touch of God. But hear me, that old man's going to beg for his life. Agag, the Bible said, came to Samuel delicately. Agag was begging for his life. And listen to me, children. You get ready to start denying yourself and putting the will of God first. You better believe your old man's going to beg for its life. Let me give you three things. Come on, Brother Chris, you plan will help me quit. Not a whole lot, but it'll help me a little bit. I didn't want to be untruthful. 
I want you to notice his clothing. Look at what he did. Here he is. Elijah's been called up by the chariot. And there stands old Elijah. Can I have my man obey? Where's old brother Laddie at? Is he in here? Hey, brother Laddie, I'm getting in the middle of the church today. Last time the mantle fell, it got hung up between heaven and earth. And we about burnt the church down. That's all Brother Virgil Rabarna reminded me for. He said, dear God, Brother Stroud threw his coat and about burnt the church down. That's what he said. Look at here. Elijah's watching the chariot go out of the sky. And that mantle falls. I want to praise God it didn't get hung up. Hallelujah. You ever thought about this? Never one time did God tell Elisha to pick it up. He didn't make him pick it up, Brother Andrew. It fell, and your King James Bible said, Elisha took up the mantle of Elijah. It didn't say, Brother Chris, that he was commanded to, or he was forced to, or he was made to, or he was spoken to. It fell out of heaven, and he picked it up. I believe he wanted it. I believe he picked it up and it was still warm. It still had the heat of Elijah, Elijah's body on it. And his hero was gone. But he had left him with a tangible evidence of what used to be, what is, and what's going to be. Hallelujah. What was the first thing he did? He picked it up, and the Bible said that he rend his own garments. We understand how those clothes in the Bible are a picture of righteousness. And what did he do? The first thing he did uh, before he ever took a step with the mantle, uh, he passed judgment upon his own righteousness. He passed judgment on his own self. uh, And he said, I'm not worthy to carry the mantle. Adam and Eve, everything was fine until they took of that fruit. And all of a sudden, they knew their righteousness wasn't good. And what did they do? They made themselves fig leaves and aprons. But then God came walking in. And all of a sudden, they knew their efforts weren't good enough. God walked in there and passed judgment on them. Come here, Brother Andrew. God passed judgment on them, but it didn't stop there. He went over and got him an animal. He slew the animal and took its coat and put it on old Adam. And now Adam was all right because that which used to clothe another is now clothing him. Can I tell you why I'm going to make it in when I go to heaven? Uh, Because that which used to clothe another uh, is now clothing me. Uh, I'm not going to get in on my own righteousness. uh, But the righteousness of the Son of God uh, has been imputed to me. Amen. And now, oh, Elisha had rent his garments. Come here, Brother Ryan. You're a preacher's son. You're a walking illustration. Just like Riley and Carter and every other preacher's child. I was listening to him pour his heart out to God last night about getting filled. I was meditating this morning before I came. Get back down there. You know what I felt like he was doing as I meditated and prayed for him this morning over there? He was rending his garments. He was rending what he is. He was rending what he was. Oh, Elisha looked down and he said, man, if I wear these clothes, all they're going to think about these clothes identify me as that old affluent farmer that I used to be. And I'm not the man I used to be. And he said, I don't want people to know the man I was. So what did he do? He ran his own garments and he divested himself of everything he was and began to put that mantle on. And now he wanted to be everything that Elijah was. May I say, you'll never get a mantle until you divest your of your own abilities. 
And let me tell you what will happen. You just keep rending them garments. You just keep rending them garments. Come here, young lady from Brother Chris's church. I've watched her grow up, weep in the power of God. Got a heart for the Lord, Brother Chris. I believe that with all my heart. Come right over here. Just get down right there. I've seen her get in the Holy Ghost and weep, cry, beg God for his touch. Can I borrow your coat for a minute, Brother, Brother Gravin? You just keep renting them garments. And one day you're going to lift your eyes. Brother Ryan, just keep renting your garments, son. And one day you're going to get up from a rending. And there's going to be a filling. Right there. Can I tell you, young person, no rending, there'll be no filling. Hey man, friend. Hey, listen, he put them clothes on. He said, listen, hey, I want them when they see me. Uh, well, I'm going to put Elijah's medal on. Uh, and from now on, when they see Elisha, they're not going to see Elisha. Uh, but they're going to see Elijah. And when they see me in this mantle, they're not going to be able to think about who I am. Uh, but they're going to think about who he is. You just keep wanting it. And when you sit over there and you get ready to get on that piano and play, spend some time rending in the week. And when your fingers touch that ivory on that piano to play, you may look up one day and there's gonna be a touch that you've not known before. It's gonna be a familiar touch, but a good bit stronger. Hey, I've felt the wind before, but I've never felt the wind of a whirlwind. Hey, man. Hey, I know what it feels like. Hey, now, I ain't never seen this quite like this till I studied this time. Brother Morgan, now, Elijah was a great man. Elisha had known him intimately and obeyed his call. Elijah had, for, listen, he had stood up to Ahab. Ahab trembled in his presence. He'd shut the door of heaven, took on the province of Baal, and because of all those mighty works, he was rejected of men. And after they rejected him, he was taken away. Now there's a man in heaven, and now there's a man on earth. And the man on earth has got a double portion of the power of God because the man that used to be on earth is now in heaven and because the man who used to be on the earth has gone to the Father in heaven and left him a double portion of the power of God. All the responsibility of Elisha was was to now live the life of the man that was in heaven by the power that he had left behind. I know somebody else that did that. He went up, and when he went up, he came down. And you know now what our responsibility is? To live the life of the man that used to be on earth, but now is in heaven by the power that he left us to do it with. His clothing. What about his calling? Won't you get your mantle right there? Get your mantle, Brother Ryan. Everybody okay? I, did, I didn't say I was quitting. I said, Brother Chris, playing would help me quit. It ain't helping a lot yet, but I'm getting there. Wrap it up. Hey, Brother Jared, come here. Huh, run. Come here, Brother Chris. Come right down here. Come right here. Y'all are men of God. Come right down here with your young lady, Brother Chris. Everybody okay? Don't get nervous. You're welcome to the 430 hour if you want it, praise God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Play on, Brother Jerry. That's your man of God. You've seen the Lord do it for him, haven't you? That's your man of God. 
And you even got to know that man of God in a more intimate way than most people do. You've seen him up. You've seen him down. You've seen what it is. And I'll be honest with you, for him to still want it, it's a real blessing. Just because it's not, it's just because he's seen the burden. He's seen the reality of what the ministry is. He ain't seen all that's in the light. He's seen what's going on in the dark. And you've seen God do it for him, haven't you? You know where the first place that Elisha took the man of God, he took it back to the last place that he had seen God do it for his preacher. And here's where I get my title. They're holding that wrapped up mantle on the banks of the Jordan. Now this is real homiletically correct. I preached the introduction and I preached one point and part of the second point. And now I'm about to give my title. What would he have said standing on the banks of the Jordan when he was holding that mantle? I believe if he'd have cried like this, he'd have said, oh Lord, send the power just now oh Lord send the power just now I did one long ago Lord I watched you do it for Elijah I watched you do it for the men of God oh, but now they're gone and I've got the mantle and Lord I want to cast it in the Jordan and I want to know what it is to operate in that same power so maybe You'll just bow your head and say, Oh, Lord, send the power just now. There's going to come in your line. If God gives you a mantle, there's going to be a crisis soon after you get it. They walked out of Egypt under the bloodstained banner before they knew it. The Red Sea was in front of them and Pharaoh's army was behind them. Jacob got the blessing of God and as soon as he got done getting the blessing of God, he heard Esau was coming with 400 armed men. Amen. Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration just saw God in his glory and they walked off that glorious mountain and they walked face to face with a demon-possessed boy. If you get a man, he's going to put you in a place to show you It'll work. There'll come a time that you're going to have to say, Oh Lord, send the power just now. And what you're going to find out is all that power that you saw in Him, it ain't going to be in Him anymore, it's going to be in you. You're not going to have to observe it from a distance, but you're going to be able to experience it. What I'm saying, I need another generation of that'll stay behind the plow and stay behind the prophet and make a lonely path and hang around to a man of falls. But then when the man of falls, I'll be willing to take it up and cast it in your Jordan and part the water. That was his calling. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where is he? And won't it be wonderful when y'all find out he's right there with you? And I promise you this, young person, God will never call you or ask you to do anything that he will not give you the power to do. It's calling. It's clothing. But by, what about his carrying? God didn't give him a mantle to put himself on display. Well, John, where was the first place he went? He went to Jericho. He went to that cursed place. You know what he bumped into first, though? He bumped into them 50 sons of the prophets. Can I say it this way? He took it number one to a liberal generation. Them 50 sons of the prophet had stood there from afar off 
and watched Elijah be taken away in a chariot of fire with the horsemen of heaven. And they didn't even believe what they saw. People say seeing is believing, it wasn't for them. They had saw it. And they say, we need to get a party together because the Lord's probably taking him out in the wilderness and dropped him off. Let me just say it this way. They didn't even believe in eternal security. They didn't believe the Holy Ghost was enough to get Elijah to heaven. And let me tell you something, this liberal generation today don't believe what we got is good enough to get us to heaven. Hey, but that's why God will give us another mantle up for another day because there is a liberal generation that doesn't believe God is who he said he was. But you give me a hundred, two hundred, a thousand teenagers who will work and labor and get a touch of God. We can change the next generation. Took it to a liberal generation. But then he went to Jericho. The statement was about Jericho, the water was bad and the ground was barren. In other words, Brother Bo, he took it to a lost generation. He asked for a new cruise, which would have been an earthen vessel. Hebrews said that the Lord had an earthen vessel. He had a body. What did he do? He put salt in that cruise, went over and poured it in that water and it healed that water. You know what salt is made up of? I remember in chemistry, my junior year of high school, we'd take that sodium metal, drop it in water, and it'd blow up that whatever it was in. Sodium would kill you by itself. Chlorine is gas that will kill you by itself. But when you put chlorine and you put sodium metal together, you get sodium chloride, which is salt. Sounds a whole lot like Jesus. His deity by itself would kill us. His humanity by itself would kill us. But when you put his humanity and his deity together, hey, he came to save us. You say, what was he taking to Jericho? He was taking the gospel of the grace of God. He was taking Jesus Christ to a cursed world. And may I say, if you want a double portion, it's not gonna be to manifest the flesh, but it's gonna be to take it to a lost world. Took it to a lost generation. He took it to a liberal generation. Then he went over there and them children come out mocking him. We've already heard this week, where is the promise of his coming? They're mocking him. Mocking him. You remember how many children there were? Somebody tell me. How many children were there? How many? 42. How many she bears were they? Two. What were they saying to him? Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. What were they mocking? They were mocking the rapture. They said, hey, he left. Let's see you leave. How many witnesses are there in Revelation 11? Two. What's God going to do when them two witnesses are killed? He's going to raise them up and take them to where? Heaven. And then what's going to happen? The last three and a half years of the great tribulation. Tell me how many months are three and a half years? 42 months. He just didn't take him, Brother Laddie, to a liberal generation. And he just didn't take him to a lost generation. But I believe he took him to the last generation. I believe with all my heart, I'm preaching to the generation who's going to see the coming of God. I got good news for you, Bo. It's available. Sweetheart, I've got good news for you. It's available if you're hungry and thirsty. Liverpool, England, I believe it was. An elderly black gentleman would walk up to a place where it commemorized the place where General William Booth had got filled with the Holy Ghost. 
That elderly black gentleman didn't know how those men that were operating that site would, would, would respond to his question. He looked at him and said, is it all right if a man says his prayers here? And the preacher that was working there said, yes, sir, it's okay. And they said that elderly black gentleman, child of God, got down by that plaque commemorating the place where General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, got filled with the Holy Ghost. And they said, this is all he prayed. Dear Lord, would you do it again? Dear Lord, would you do it again? What are you going to do? With me and Brother Dean and Brother Gravel and Brother Morgan and your dad. We're gone. It's available. You can have it if you want it bad enough. You can have it if you want it bad enough. What you gonna do when he's gone? But Chris Hammond, Brother Gravis, Jackie. That's not my mantle. That's your Elijah's mantle. What will you do with it? Will you be clothed in it? Will you be willing to walk to the Jordan and say, Lord, send the power just now. I want to operate in that kind of power. Brother Jared's going to sing. Hey, young ladies, this ain't just for boys. We need some spirit-filled ladies. We got enough, we got enough flesh and carnality. We need some young ladies who are filled with the power of God. While Brother Jared sings, I wonder how many of us will make around an altar. And maybe you'll say, oh Lord, send the power just now. How about it? We're standing. That'll help you come, maybe. How many of us should make our way into an altar and say, Lord, we need some spirit-filled mamas, some spirit-filled daddies. Every preacher in here needs some spirit-filled laymen. Hey, every church represented in this place needs a Holy Ghost man of God. Lord, what you doing again? Oh, Lord, send the power just now. And 
under all. 